Okay, welcome. It is terrific to see so many of you in the room. We're looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, access to capital, finding your way through the financial forest and finding the right investor. My name is Jana Kakar. I'm the global managing partner of Dahlberg. And Dahlberg, for those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, we are an impact a driven firm. Uh, we do business strategy and investment advisory across emerging and frontier markets. Um, in my experience, a conversation like the one we're going to have today is particularly powerful um, because, uh, frankly, you know, capital is, to state the obvious, the lifeblood of the companies that we seek to seed and grow. I recall reading the other day that something like 80% of the companies that fail in the US, they don't fail because there's a lack of uh, market potential or success at the stage at the rat or internal management conflict, but surely a lack of cash. And so in the context of the Entrepreneurship Summit, having a conversation about private capital and the various forms that my illustrious panelists represent here today is, is going to be a very powerful one. Now, um, private equity was probably, a, I once, let's see if I get it order of magnitude right, but a, last year in 2018, probably about 700 billion in private equity was raised globally. And I would, I would say if you think about private equity, you think about venture, it's probably somewhere between two and 300 billion. And of course, angel is very hard to estimate, uh, but maybe 20 to 50 billion. And these are just single stock you know, years of raising. So it's an enormous amount of capital, and the question becomes, how do you figure out how to harness it, how to connect with the investors who represent that capital and build the relationships with those investors that can uh, seed and grow your companies? So that's going to be the purpose of the conversation today. And I'll turn now and introduce my panelists, but to give you a bit of a preview of how we'll uh, organize the discussion. Um, following introductions, the group of us will have a conversation up here. And then in relatively short order, uh, we will pass it uh, to you all and have a Q&A session. I will confess to you right away uh, that I'm a great fan of concise questions. <laughs> and I am shameless when it comes to nipping in a bud anything that um, is actually not a question, but more of a soliloquy, um, or anything that turns into a pitch. So this is a chance, really, for you to ask the interesting question based on what you hear today. Um, and so hopefully we'll have a really lively, a lively interaction. So with no further ado, why don't I start down the end with Carrie Lee. Carrie Lee Sinclair of Kin Group. Uh, Kin Group is a single family office, venture capital in Melbourne, focusing primarily in the sectors of food, tech, and manufacturing. And in addition, Carrie Lee brings a perspective not just of the work she does with Kin, uh, but she also advises uh, the government, Australian government, on emerging innovations and uh, occupies the Australia chair of Springboard Enterprises, which is a set of network resources for women-led companies. So welcome, Carrie Lee. Next to Carrie is Ivo Lernick, who leads at the Amsterdam office of CVC Capital Partners, which is a private equity and credit investment firm with about 75 billion in assets under management, some 120 plus billion uh, committed, and 53, 55 billion in private equity. And CVC focuses in a slightly uh, larger scale company, the sort of middle market of 200 million, give or take. So welcome, Ivo. And in the center of the group is Gabrielle Gay. Gabrielle is the Director of Emerging Markets um, Strategy at Kensington Capital Holdings, which is also a single family office in Boston. And she does investing in private equity funds under a billion. Um, and Kensington also has a VC arm. So Gabrielle will be able to uh, share perspectives from both of those uh, capital pools. Um, Gabrielle is also the COO of a college uh, in Ghana and launched the Schumpeter Center for Innovation and Development that enables entrepreneurial systems, ecosystems to thrive in less mature markets. We're not sure how she does that in what free time, but there you go. <laughs> and last but certainly not least is Joshua Siegel, who is the managing partner of Rubicon Venture Capital in New York. And primarily Joshua does investing in late seed, Series A, some B, I believe, 
um, in high potential and disruptive technology companies. So with other over 35 investees around Asia, the US, and Europe, uh, Joshua will be able to tell us what that financial forest looks like, particularly for the tech sector. So to kick us off, uh, maybe to, uh, an opening question to all my panelists, which is you've seen an innumerable number of entrepreneurs and enterprises and engage them in conversation about their capital needs, uh, your investee needs, so on and so forth. What is the one thing that you would share that has been a lesson learned about how to start up, strike a relationship? As you've engaged in these conversations with other entrepreneurs, what have you noticed over the years? What has been the lesson learned that you would pass to our audience today? I'll, I'm going to pick whomever is not looking me in the eye. <laughs> Evo, you want to kick us off? <laughs> uh, yeah, so my answer is different from others. Maybe. may want to grab a mic there. Does it work? Yes. yes my answer will be different from the others. Maybe not, maybe yes. Uh, so we look at the later stage companies uh, that have uh, proven business model market leadership positions. And when we engage with a founder entrepreneur, it starts with the relationship, but, but in, and as important, common vision on where to bring the company uh, to next. And it's all about a partnership around accelerating growth. And uh, every company, although they're doing well, has an ambition that they do not have sufficient capital for. And we're there to provide that capital. And um, so the common roadmap, common strategic vision is driving, should drive the relationship. I had, had the pleasure of uh, engaging many entrepreneurs, especially over the last uh, day or two here. And so it's been an interesting opportunity to absorb the different approaches. And I would say some definitely fall in the successful category and some do not. Um, but, but like Evo said, um, relationships are really important. Um, if you're just going to come blindly pitch me and you have no idea of the geographies I'm interested in or the industries or, or really the stage that we're looking at, you may be wasting your time and you may be wasting my time. And I, so I, I say that there's a respectful way to approach these conversations, probably to ask a few initial questions to make sure that um, there's a, an initial alignment and then an exploration of some of those deeper things. Um, but I, for, for me, it, it's, it's very much about the relationship, the work that's done. Um, I will also, and this may come out later in the conversation, but networks are really important to me. And so figuring out, you know, um, perhaps, and, and I, I say that early stage entrepreneurs need more than just capital. A lot of times they're coming to me for capital, but family offices, and I would say generally most people on the stage, we have things that are also valuable that could be um, a, a better fit for you, our, our networks and our connections, our expertise. And so you may explore, if we say no about capital, there may be other things that we're willing to offer that may be just as valuable. Uh, so continuing on from what Gabrielle said, building the relationship to start is really important from the standpoint that you need to understand who the VC is first, not at the meeting, but do your research beforehand. We already know who we are, what we do. You need to know who we are and what we do, but you need to find that out independently. When you're coming to a meeting, I don't want to hear myself talk. I'm interested in asking you questions and knowing more about you, right? So be prepared to answer those questions. There's nothing worse than asking a question of the entrepreneur and saying, well, he says, I don't know you yet. I don't want to tell you that. Like that's an instant disqualification kind of thing. So be prepared to be open and you know, know your audience, right? Uh, also, continuing on, there are a lot of things I can do for early stage companies prior to funding where I can make a introduction to someone high up at a company that you might want to do business with, and they are going to take my email, they're typically going to respond to it, and they'll typically then take a meeting or a phone call with the founder, just on my say-so, right? And so it's a relationship-driven business. Uh, so that's very important. So be open to those sort of things. Be open to critiques about your business. Be, be receptive to maybe changing some certain things or being uh, less defensive but more reactive. And those are just a couple of things. 
So maybe let me pick up on these two themes. So do your research and approach with the perspective of a relationship and relationship building. So Carrie Lee, tactically, um, if I am an entrepreneur, but I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly well networked, I'm on the outside of whatever inner circle may exist, what are the kinds of ways in which I can do my research and learn about the investor before I go and have that conversation? Beyond the, you know, beyond the, the Google search or what have you, what kinds of uh, networks or associations or other resources would you and others suggest I tap? I mean, I think it, you mentioned it, a relationship. I mean, I, you know, some people don't like the analogy, but it's a bit like dating. You know, if if you and I know there's people that have been successful on online dating, but if you just go and see the photo of the person and decide they're your life partner, you're probably going to find out pretty quickly that that might not actually be, even be a photo of the person that you're talking to, right? So, I mean, I think you know the reality of it is the way what we do most things in life um, will be from a, a human connection of some sort. Um, one of the things that didn't come out in my bio is I spent 20 years operating high growth businesses, including my own, which I sold to Microsoft. So I've sat on the other side and had to pitch for money. And the thing I found really useful was telling everybody at a barbecue, hey, I got a startup, I'm raising a million dollars. And that's actually how I got our first seed investor was somebody said, somebody told somebody else who said, oh, I know somebody that's looking to invest in a million dollars, you know? And so it, that's actually, no lie, that's how I got my first check. So it wasn't going Googling, trying to find the perfect match on online. It was actually just being really thoughtful about the world will help me if I'm thoughtful about what I ask. And that communication that got us all here as human beings will continue to get us where we need to be. Then I had to deliver what I said I was going to do. And then they continued to invest in me and then introduced me to other investors. So I think you have to, again, don't jump to the marriage. Um, actually just think about it as what resources do you have and how can you actually enable them and allow them to be thoughtful and do the work for you. Um, Australia is a relatively small market, um, but you know we always joke that in Melbourne particularly there's two degrees of separation because everybody in Melbourne knows everybody, but you know, even if you do the Kevin Bacon six degrees of separation, if you can actually, you know, uh, say to one person and it goes six times out, you're going to hit an investor or someone that's got capital. So I think anyone that says, maybe if you're in emerging markets where the capital's not developed, but anything that's any sort of English speaking Western market, I'm confident that you can get, you know, within four or five conversations, you'll have somebody that's in a position to give you capital. So. Uh, just to add a uh, simple advice, the best way to get to know an investor is to interview the CEO of a portfolio company, of another investment company. Because then, and then also to look at the track record. So what have they done in partnership on this other investment? So that's that's two or three calls, two or three meetings, and then you know you've done your DD. I'll add a follow-up to that. Um, <clears throat> From an entrepreneurial perspective, you've you've created something, you've brought it into this world, and uh, sometimes being desperate for capital will mean you will go anywhere. And I've seen many entrepreneurs that have got capital that that is not helpful to them, and it, it can destroy a company. and And really, what you're giving up is is ownership, and you enter into a partnership with your capital partner, and they can be very unreasonable. And so I think your advice of talking to a portfolio company to say, what it is, what is it like to partner with these people? You're giving something to them that you've created, and that's no small thing. And they're very irresponsible, and, and I would say capital partners that are not well-suited for some entrepreneurs. So I, I think that is really wise advice. Um, and so I, I, I guess just to follow on with that is, is, is um, Try to avoid being too desperate. Figure out what kind of capital you want, what you're prepared to put on the table, and what you're not. And then seek after aligned uh, partners on, on that level. This is dating analogy really does work. So don't, don't appear too desperate, but open and available and interested. Um, how, how, do, how do you think about when the right moment is? for you to take on capital, to your point, Gabrielle, that it's not always a good thing. Um, and also, what 
what kind of capital? Because there are choices, right, at every inflection point during the life cycle, and you may choose to self-fund for some portion, you may choose friends and family, you may get debt, you know, for some portion. So any sort of reflections um, for many of you, and maybe Joshua, I'll pick on you, um, on this question of, you know, how to think about when the right time to take capital and what kind? So capital is, you know, oxygen. It's basically the money you need to survive on an ongoing basis always. So depending on where you are in your life cycle, you might be willing to take capital in a certain manner, shape, or form than you otherwise wouldn't be. But the point is survive and thrive, right? <clears throat> Don't certainly take capital with onerous terms so that eventually you are no longer a founder, but now you're an employee of your own company, right? That's bad. You want to avoid that at all costs. So you want to take on the right amount of capital, and typically it's for 18 months to two years of operational runway. You know, typically at the seed, late seed, and Series A stages, that's typically the amount of runway you need. And you have to think about it from the standpoint of where will this capital get me in terms of milestones, such that I will be attractive to the next round of capital that will fund me to the next stage. Okay. Uh, typical venture-backed companies operate in this manner because you're not going to get capital once. Uh, the other thing to think about is, you know, are you taking money from individuals or are you taking money from funds? When you're doing angel rounds, not every investor is going to be a value add, but certainly you want value add investors as much as possible. And the VCs definitely should be value add because they're the ones that are going to help you, and they're also going to be probably the most painful to deal with to a certain manner, shape, or form because we ask the tough questions, right? So that's important. But also, does the fund want to follow on? So depending on the stage of the VC, we don't want to write one check. Right? We want to write a check, take a chance, and then we want to write a bigger check. So never, ever say to anyone that's giving you funding, this is the last money I'll ever need. Nobody believes it. It's never true. Don't say it. It's not to your benefit. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the only thing I'd add to that, um, and we tend to be a later stage because of this, but I think it's actually because a lot of entrepreneurs don't think about it the right way, which is capital efficiency. At the end of the day, every dollar, if you can make 25 cents, from every dollar, I, you know, so if you, I, I get a dollar twenty-five for every dollar that I give you, and you can prove that because you've used your own money and you're going to get that return. And then my money, you're going to drive that value, even if you're pre-revenue, right? Because at the end of the day, you're going to be investing my capital into your business. And if you can do that efficiently and get a really, I love the value in milestones. If you can get to a milestone that increases your value, I'm going to do well on that as well. But it's actually how you use your capital. I mean, I think there's a perception from watching too many movies and about the Silicon Valley that, you know, the first thing you do is get like, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the food, you know, in, delivered into the offices and you get all this nice branding and stuff because people get, you know, you got venture capital now. It looks really cool. But the reality is that's not efficient capital for me because if it doesn't translate into sales, revenue, profit, then it's, it's not going to return to me. Um, and so I think that there's that that efficiency you can do even pre-revenue because it's what you're doing your time. It's how you're spending your time. It's how you're allocating what you do have to your business that shows me that capital efficiency that then I'm confident that you're going to return something to me. And I think if you think about your business that way rather than you need my money because you're going to be successful. I mean, we quite often see people that say, well, Milestone's hiring a head of sales. That's not a milestone. That's like a person. Like, how is that? What is a head of sales going to get? 50% chance you're going to get it wrong. And that person's not going to be your head of sales. And I've just paid for their salary for you to get it wrong. That's not capital efficiency. It, 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 so sometimes I think you just have to think about it slightly differently. Yeah, I think that's really compelling. It's basically, you know, you, raising capital for an input is not is not the thing. It's you're raising capital because there's a milestone output that you believe that you can achieve with it. And if you do, you will get a higher valuation, which then you protect your company right. from someone owning it. Yeah. Now, Gabriel, I have to ask you to opine on this question of that Joshua touched on of the different dynamics of getting VC versus PE. Um, and which one is the, the greater, the lesser pain? You've seen both sides, of course. Tell us a bit about that. Well, I'll, I'll speak to how we approach things from a Kensington Capital perspective. We, we are a single family office. Um, we do do a lot of uh, private equity deals and we have a venture capital arm. Um, this is gonna be a theme for the conversation, but, but our deals are relationship driven. We are 
somewhat agnostic to industry and geography. Um, we are very interested in cultivating partnerships, and we have found we do enter in at a growth stage. Um, uh, and and so we 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 have expertise. We want to leverage our connections. We want to leverage other portfolio companies that that we have uh, to your gain. And so. Um, we are not looking for, and so this will, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with family office. They come in a lot of shapes and sizes. And they, they've created a family office to go out of, after very specific things that are of interest to the family. So I, I, I'm very careful to speak on behalf of our approach. Um, we have, we take a longer time, we, we have a longer time horizon. We're, we're looking at, Past the five years, we're looking at seven and ten-year partnerships, and really building value in that company, and and looking how to add it strategically within our portfolio. And so, it's um, when you come to us, if you're just coming for capital, you're not the right partner. We've got to figure out how it ties into our portfolio, other relationships, and and entities that we can leverage there. So, um, so so that's very much how how we look at who we invest in, what companies. We we would take um, we would look at taking a partnership in. Other thoughts? Yeah, Eva. Yeah, so as I said at the beginning, we are looking at companies that have been in existence already for for ten or fifteen or twenty years. But um, it all depends. What I said earlier on what the goal is for the capital. If the goal is to if you have a company that is leading in the Benelux but wants to wants to expand into Germany or wants to expand into Asia or the U.S., then please choose a partner, and a capital provider, that has capability in those regions to help you buy other companies or to help you grow. Um, um, so that, is, that, is, that makes the choice more limited, but that's, that's how you should drive your decision making. Makes a lot of sense. So, so maybe speak a bit now, and I'll, I'll ask to run down the line. Relationship keeps being a theme, and the notion of it's not just about get capital and, and sort of exit stage left. Um, describe maybe a little bit about what does that interaction look like between you and your investee? You know, it, you've got 35, I think, currently, give or take, um, at Rubicon. So if I, if I, if I start, if I'm, if I'm one of your investees, and I, it is about the long term, it's about relationship building, what does our interaction look like? Paint me a bit of a picture. So, so thankfully now we only have 28 operational companies. We've had exits and certainly a few losses, but a lot of it has to do with reporting. So we will get uh, at least quarterly updates from our companies, and when it's early on in an investment cycle, typically monthly. So it's very important for the entrepreneurs to be transparent about things. So letting us know what happens, what is going to happen, key milestones, but then also asks. So at the end of every email, there should be an ask. Can you introduce me to so-and-so? I need this, I'm hiring, all these kinds of things. And we take a very proactive approach with each of our companies to learn what it is they will need over the course of the year and make notes to ourselves to determine when are they ready for this introduction. So it's very important to keep that dialogue going there will be a point, and this has happened with several of our companies, where they outgrow us, they get too big, they go on to the Series B stage, C stage, C and D stages, where they need different kind of help. And so we can't necessarily help them every day, but on occasion we'll be very helpful with certainly senior hires or getting a strategic relationship in place or something like that. And then the communication is less so uh, just from a monthly or quarterly basis, but we still have that open. Um, they can certainly help our earlier companies with mentorship and things of that nature. But it's always a two-way street. You know, we will ask them for something, they will ask us for something. And sometimes it can get tense. I mean, there are times where we have to educate the entrepreneur and explain to them that you can't do this. This is bad. This will cause real problems. And as much as I love all my children, even my real children and my, and my portfolio companies, uh, sometimes you have to spank them right? In real life, okay? And it's a problem. And what you need to understand is being an investor and being an entrepreneur is not a marriage. Marriage, you can get out of. It's called divorce. It happens all the time. Lawyers will always be around. You cannot get rid of an investor. It's virtually impossible. You can get them bought out, but that's at their discretion. So be very careful as to who you're taking on as an investor 
And obviously, we're very careful about who we invest in. Okay, but that relationship goes on for years and years and years. And I'm investing not only in the founder and his team, but then maybe the other founders that are on his team that aren't yet founders or don't know that they're founders yet. You know, the next companies that are going to be born out of these companies. So it's very important. You know, you want to be known as a good person, a good investor, but also shrewd. You want mutual respect, you know, all those things. So um, you can create such things that resemble prenups, and I think that there's some wisdom in, in understanding that, that you cannot predict how things will go. And when you're arranging things um, from a, a legal and bus business perspective, you can create some things that make it a little easier to untangle. So that's just a piece of... Right, right. Um, I will just give you an example, and hopefully this will be more helpful than me talking about the abstract. We work closely with a, a fintech company in South America, and we've watched it from very early stages go from one country to another, and they're in about six now. Um, the transparency piece is key. They came to us, they come to us with some of their challenges, and we operate some businesses, we, we have a lot of expertise there, so they, they view us more than just as a capital partner and, and as a true partner. And they came to us with a business model that wasn't going to go the distance with them in South America. They weren't cutting it. And um, we partnered with them to develop a solution. We brought in another relationship with a US bank. And uh, we entered into a dialogue with them with how, how can we make the banking product that is successful in South America actually relevant and, and carve out some market space in the US. And so we are in the midst of doing that and trying to, to solve some of the financial and business model challenges of a portfolio company. And that's really what we're willing to do. We are willing to leverage uh, relationships and other portfolio companies to help you succeed. If you're not transparent with us, we won't do that. And also, I will tell you, um, in this relationship, uh, we wanted to connect them with this bank about eight months ago. And they didn't jump on it. And the relationship almost completely dissolved because they were not responsive to what we were offering. I mean, when you're in partnership together, I think, Carrie Lee, you said this earlier, we succeed if you succeed. And honestly, a good partner wants that for you. And so um, we will do our best to help you get there. And so to be open for the, to the things that we are trying to offer and suggest perhaps, you know, maybe changing your business models or creating a whole other line of business to help you be successful. And, and if you talk to successful entrepreneurs, how, how many of them are doing the exact thing that they set out to do? Entrepreneur's life is full of pivots. And you may find in your capital partner that they want you to pivot, and it's necessary. And you know many relationships on our part have dissolved because entrepreneurs aren't willing to pivot. And those are not lasting relationships for us. When I look in our portfolio, we do write many checks. We're, we're there for the long haul. We want to help you succeed, succeed that way. And so it, it may mean some pivots, uh, but, but that is really how, how we view partnership in the long term. Yeah, the other thing I was just going to add to that is that I think you have to be very careful about the difference between the shareholder and the investor. So. Most of us are deploying capital on behalf of someone else who will be your shareholder. Um, and just like if you were to take money from a bank, your bank manager might decide to move. And then you've got another bank manager, right? So I think there's a lot of people, even though I do the whole dating analogy and there's a marriage discussion, you're not actually, if, if I invest in you, you're not actually, your relationship with me is I'm a professional representing a shareholder. And if I decide to start another business and go raise my capital, you're going to get the representative from the shareholder that the shareholder decides. So again, understanding the model or the, the type of backup that you have for the fact that we're none of us are going to live forever, no matter how many health people are going to tell me, pitch to me that they've cured the, the, the dying thing that we all experience as humans. The, the reality is, is you've got to be very careful that the relationship that you build also has to, I mean, it needs to be one-on-one -on -one to get in the door and get funded, but you need to have a relationship with whoever your shareholder is across whoever it is. And sometimes that can be challenging because the person may not want to introduce you to everybody else, but you need to then 
take that as part of your responsibility, particularly if you're going to have, um, with all due respect to some corporate VCs and stuff that you start to get in as investors, they're big machines that you don't know who you're, they could have a head of innovation one day and then the next head of innovation the next day and that's suddenly the person you're dealing with and you've got to start all over again. So just keep in mind that other odd dynamic. One more? Yeah. Uh, maybe a theme some people in the room don't like to hear, but um, for us an important theme is to make the company less dependent on the founder entrepreneur. Um, so to, we call it institutionalize the business, meaning decision making, governance is all is all running smoothly, or smoothly is not the right word, but is independent from the skills and talents of certain key people, such as the founder entrepreneur. So institutionalizing that is not easy because a company has been successful because of the way they've been doing it in the past. But one of our roles is, as new new capital provides on the block, is to actually bring in those that new, fresh pair of eyes and to make certain tough decisions in terms of changing processes, changing certain decision-making um, uh, uh, ways of working. That's helpful. So how, one quick follow-up question. Imagine that we are in the lucky position as an entrepreneur of uh, raising capital for more than one investor. You know, we often have conversations about the portfolio of investees from this side of the room, but if I'm an entrepreneur, I might be thinking, what about my portfolio of investors? Any practical advice from any one of you on um, how you've seen entrepreneurs handle well or less well if the guidance from their investors is in conflict with one another? Uh, so we've seen that on more than one occasion, unfortunately. And so <clears throat> you do want to have a balance in your capitalization table. Typically, you will have a lead investor once you get to the Series A stage and beyond, or you might have two co-leads or even more. But generally speaking, you're going to have one major investor that's going to be on your board and will have certain rights and privileges. But you want to be able to tap your other investors in your cap table for advice and counsel. And there's nothing worse than letting a problem at the company fester so that it gets to the board level. So one of the things that we do is that we're actually not the lead investor in any of our companies. We, we have led deals, we have priced them, but we're not actually the lead investor, uh, which puts us at an advantage because we don't have a fiduciary responsibility to the other investors in the cap table. So if there is a problem at the company, I'm usually the first phone call from the company. Because either I can fix it, or tell them how to deal with it, or get them a resource, or whatever it is that needs to be done. If I don't hear about it till the board level, there's nothing I can do, right? And so you want to have a relationship with more than just your lead investor to help you and sometimes deflect what might become a problem with the lead investor, because the lead investor is not necessarily always on your side. Uh, there definitely should be alignment of interests, but there could potentially be a conflict depending on the stage and what's going on. So, you know, making sure that you can get advice and counsel from the other investors as well is important. And, you know, don't misunderstand the fact that all of the investors typically know each other or they're one removed. So you do have to be careful about how you have these conversations because you know, my relationship with the other investors is deep, many years, it's going to go on and on. I'm not necessarily willing to risk that for a company that might have a problem. I'll just tell them what I think, and I'll be like, you've got to go talk to your lead investor. Okay, I won't necessarily do it, but I'll be like, you have to talk to them, you have to lay it out. Okay, and so that's just one of the, the issues that can come up. Kind of thing. Yeah, please. Um. There, there is a, um, there, there are relationships in capital providers, and it, it's a smaller world than you all might think. Um, when we're choosing to invest in a, a company and build a relationship, we're asking our network, do you know them? Do you know people that know them? And so your reputation actually travels far sometimes. So it, especially when it comes to a portfolio of investors, don't think that you can mistreat one and not have the others be offended by that or, or know about it. So I'll just say we're, we're geared into each other. We're talking. We're trying to understand how to help you and uh, to treat one investor badly or poorly, disrespectfully. It, 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 the word does get around. So I just put that out as a word of, of advice. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that's a great point to emphasize because um, just the other day I got called, asked uh, an investor asking just an opinion on the personality of someone that I have not seen since first year of college. But it just goes to show that we know that management team is important, and you, you hear that said. But if you start to unpack what does that mean, management team is important, it is getting to know what kind of person is this, is this person, and, and investors will go deep to discover that. Carrie Lee. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, um, you know, I get teased sometimes at conferences like this from being in Australia, but I guarantee you that if any of these people get an opportunity to invest in a company in Australia, they're going to call me. Right, because they're going to go. You know the market. You know this company. Why aren't they raising in Australia? And that's you know. And I would do the same for Amsterdam, Boston, New York. Like I would bring these guys. I've got a deal in Boston. I'm going to go to you and see if you've seen it. What you know. So I think that that it's not just a you're raising money in LA and it's the LA network. It'll actually be an international network, particularly as you start to grow and go into the market. So um, I do think it's a constant conversation, as I said, and we want to build relationships between ourselves as well. So it's a good reason for us to keep in contact. Well, there's a lot more for us to discuss sectors. Uh, we had a slew of other questions, but I think it's a good moment to open it up. Um, and, oh, lovely, okay, well, that was fantastic. Why, um, I'll take a few questions, just a couple, and then uh, turn to my panelists and we can parse them out as, as makes sense. Um, so, the lady here in the third row, please. I am, I am. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, I'm Sonia Davidson, H2 Energy Now. My question is this, on a second round investment, has there ever been a first investor that you walked away because it was the first investor? Because of some question about legality or whatever. You don't have to give names, but does this type of thing ever happen? Okay, thank you. A couple of others? Uh, yes, Cosito in the front, please. Good afternoon. I'm Kizito from Twin Two on Sloan in South Africa. The question is for all panelists. I'm just checking, do you invest rather directly in startups or do you also look at funds, fund managers? Yeah. Thank you, and I'll take one more from the side of the room. I'm neglecting. Yes, please, the lady in the blue-green shirt. Hi, Beth Massa from Ozarka. Have you ever um, ignored your own investment criteria just because you loved the business that approached you so much? <laughs> That's a great question. So, okay, so question about walking away from the first investor, is it just about enterprises or also funds? And have you ever gone rogue? I welcome my panelists to take any one of those as you wish. Uh, I'll just take one in three. There's definitely negative signaling effects for certain funds, and so if we saw something that we didn't like, we would avoid the deal no matter what, right? So that, that can be an issue. In terms of going rogue, uh, the easy answer is yes, it happens. So as a fund manager, my responsibility is to really keep to my thesis approach that I have sold my LPs on that I would do, right? That I would engage with and in force as a thesis. But on occasion, if the fund is doing very well and we've already deployed much of the capital, we will then say, oh, let's take a chance and go earlier. Those are typically passion deals that either I really love the entrepreneur, right? And so the entrepreneur is very receptive, responsive, and it, it usually is about the entrepreneur, and then it's the sector that they're going into. Right, so that's very important. So one of my accolades is I was a professional chef in New York City now 18 years ago, or yeah, almost 18 years ago. So I do have a passion for certain food-related deals, which have had little to do with our first fund, but now have more to do with our second fund, because we've chosen very good deals. So I will look at those a little bit more so than I otherwise would, uh, but mostly because we do enterprise SaaS, right? So, uh, so passion deals happen. So, yeah. yeah, I was I was just going to say that um, I, I think that the interesting thing is that if you're a good investor, you put decision making processes around you to help you from making um, an emotional decision. Um, there's a book just recently out that Annie Duke, who's a well-known poker player in America, has just done called Investing in Bets. And she actually raises entrepreneurship as the biggest bet, you know, that you're ever going to make because what you're doing is you've got all this information that, you know, you know something, you don't know something, you don't know where this is going to go, and so you're going to have to make a bet. And her kind of comment is understanding the diversity of the trade-offs you're going to have to make 
um, and then allowing that someone else to independently feed that back to you. So I think that's the way we use our decision making around that. So I might get completely in love with your business, but then I have other people that I would bring in to make sure that there is actually something there we should invest in and it's not just my passion project because I will make a mistake if, if, if it's just me that's going to actually do that as much as I love you because I'm going to have a bias like that which is going to mean that I'll make a mistake. So I have to kind of put people around me to protect me from myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, so to add, um, one of the success factors of uh, an asset manager or an investor is to have a decision-making process where there is uh, enough tension and challenge to, to come to the right decision. So we have a partnership structure and all deals have to be vetted by our investment committee, which is uh, 10, 12 people that have to agree. So mm -hmm. that makes uh, rogue investing uh, almost impossible. So as a family office, we, we have a fair degree of flexibility to go after some deals that don't fa fall squarely within our what we've done in the past. Uh, but what we've tried to do within our family office is, is establish a system that imposes discipline on those on those decision-making processes. So while we will entertain rogue deals, we, we have to see how it makes sense in our portfolio. And certainly, as we're balancing those portfolios, we do reserve a segment for those big bets, the ones, you know, those moonshots that we're gonna, we believe in it, but it has to make sense and it has to, it has to go beyond just a place of passion. It, it has, we, we have to be able to validate how this is gonna add value. And, and have some value. So I'll say that to answer your question, we do both. Um, there's a place in our portfolio to invest in funds. We don't prefer that. That's not like I think that we're most excited about. Um, direct investing where it makes sense and where we can leverage some of our other expertise um, makes a lot of sense to us. So it's, it's very much about balancing our portfolio. Anyone else do funds? We don't do funds. No. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the third row. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Roman Zinchenko. I'm running Ukrainian NGO called Green Cubator, and we are helping green innovators and running one of the country's largest grant prog program with the European Bank for Construction and Development. And my question is <clears throat> pipeline conversion, because sometimes when you have the projects that received grants, for supporting the environmental endeavors, your survival rate is, let's say, 20%. How would you suggest to increase the level of conversion from the entrepreneurship grants into bankable projects? And how would you suggest to increase the survival rate? Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, the lady in the front. Hello, I'm Miriam Fonia Kassimi, and I created a startup in solar energy in Africa. My question is, you know, as entrepreneurs, we always have this arbitrage whether we should be with our clients or with our investors. The point is, what would you suggest to your experience? Should we take an advisory boutique to help us to contact you, or should we, you prefer to have direct um, first contact with the entrepreneur? Because it's really a question I think other entrepreneurs raised, whether we should create this relationship directly with you, or should we take an advisory boutique, which is its business to do, to do this relationship? Thank you. Thank you, it's a great question. And the gentleman here in the third from the back, thank you. Hi, my name is Job van der Kieft. Uh, I've got a question about crowdfunding. How do you look at uh, startups that already got crowdfunded? Because I've heard from VCs that they don't like startups which already got crowdfunded. I'm curious about that too, actually. Crowdfunding platforms is remarkable. I, I, you know, would get close to the same amount of capital being moved as we're seeing in angel investing per year. So let's start with those three and uh, just offer thoughts start on Start with the, the crowdfunding? Yes. And so it, I love it because it comes back to the capital efficiency. You've been able to raise capital and you, I assume, have delivered a product or something. Normally it's not just aspirational. You're going to deliver the, the crowd something, some sort of value. And that, to me, is a milestone. You've been able to 
especially on consumer projects, you've been able to test the market, you've been able to have people invest in your business, you've been able to use their capital to deliver something. So personally, as a family office, that's something that we are very open to and we just you know, have a lot of respect for, again, being able to actually be resourceful for how you've done it. Um, but I guess uh, uh, you know, the thing you also have to understand is a lot of um, venture capital and other funds, they have a mandate and that mandate may not allow that. But again, you can do that in your research um, it's not all VCs. It might just be what their mandate is. But. All right, so that's crowdfunding. And the other couple of questions were go through an advisor, go direct, and also uh, conversion rates, how to improve them. Uh, so just to go on with the crowdfunding, I think it needs to be qualified because if you're crowdfunding, just like equity crowdfunding, but you haven't delivered a product yet, uh, you you know you got the money survive and thrive it doesn't necessarily matter but don't mistake the valuation that you got from the crowd who are not smarter than the professional fund managers uh, from the you know realistic nature uh, people also confuse between getting equity crowdfunding and doing like pre-sales on Kickstarter or something like that if you've done a pre-sale but not delivered on the product yet that can be a negative right depending on what amount of time has gone by so you might get a certain amount of credit. Uh, with the VCs for that sort of stuff, but you really have to have the product, right? And so it, it does depend on which uh, investor you are uh, approaching, if they're seed, pre-seed, or their later stage, to depend if the crowdfunding is valuable. Uh, you know, so so it all depends. Generally, we look at it as you know, great, you got the money to survive. You know, now what kind of thing? So it it again, it's not a milestone. Right, it's helpful for you, but it let matters less than on your execution of the capital. Okay, uh, and then just on, in terms of the relationship, it's always best to get a direct point of contact with a venture capital firm, but that can happen in multiple ways. So either you meet the meet the person face to face, or you get a warm introduction from someone that knows them well that you know, because I'm more than likely to answer an email out of the blue from a name I recognize than just an entrepreneur saying, hey, I've got a great deal for you, right? And so, you know, we take the standpoint that we log every single deal that comes through our system, and we see about 5,000 deals a year, but most of them get kicked out right away because they're just not for us, right, for any matter, shape, or form. So if you want to start a dialogue, start it in a trusted way is always the best way to do it. Yeah. yeah, so on the conversion rate um, uh, to a bankable project, make sure you try to get non-government money into this as early as possible. And if that's not possible, have an advisory panel with non-government people to advise you on whether this has the potential to be a bankable project. So, so, don't, so uh, also put short fuses on the grants so that you try f with a little money and if it doesn't work, it's it. That's, that's it. So milestone-driven grants. Anything you'd like to add, Gabrielle? So crowdfunding is one signal that we look at. I agree with Joshua. It, it's, um, it, it's not the only signal, and we certainly look to validate that. Um, nothing is less appealing than say, saying, well, the crowd likes it, therefore you should, and there's an expectation that way. So it, it's one signal that we would consider. Certainly it has the value that it's been out in a marketplace for a little bit, um, so we would certainly look to validate that. To answer your question, um, I, I would just advise patients. Like we, I like to engage directly with entrepreneurs. However, looking at most of my deals, they have come through tr trusted contacts that have vetted and have this relationship. They refer me. Um, some of my favorite deals, um, it takes me a little while to get comfortable. Uh, again, we're, we're putting it through the discipline processes that we have in place. So I may just be watching you. I haven't forgotten you. Um, we're busy. We have certain capacities and, and bandwidth at certain times. But the deals that I really like, they go in a special stack, and I will come back to them. And so I, I was just, uh, I, I appreciate like respectful kind of connections. Uh, it may take me a little while to, to figure out how to layer that into the portfolio and, and just when I have bandwidth to go there because um, we do invest a lot in these deals. So I, I like the personal approach. Um, just counsel patients with that. And I will say just to pile on with my panelists, 
you framed it as, do I go direct or do I go through a professional advisor? And there are a hundred other sort of sources of warm connection and, and trusted linkages. And it could very well be that there are people that you know that work and, or in this sort of similar communities, similar companies, and they're not professional advisors, but they may be well connected by one or two degrees of separation uh, to the investor that you hope to connect with. So thinking also more broadly about uh, your own network and community and finding those touch points, I'd say I, I've seen work well. Other questions? Okay, right at the back, dancing. Yes. <laughs> that man knows how to get an investor's attention. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fred. I am from Kaimi.com. Uh, I'm originally from Ghana, Africa. Um, thanks for having me here. Just wanted, I've, not, I've been to many uh, venture capitalist uh, events, and I have noticed that um, most of in Africa is not part of the conversation. Um, I really would invite all of you, in addition to all of you on the panelists, to really consider us, especially the, there are so many young people on the continent who are doing really amazing stuff. And just to let you know, uh, just the least money that you put in goes a long way. And I'd like to let everyone know that Africa is a very young continent. And I just ask that, uh, so for us, of course, we, we won't fund it, that's why I'm here, but uh, it's really not about me, but it's really about the many young people on the continent right now. Mm -hmm. And they are working really, really, really hard, really, really smart. And I just invite you guys to okay. really consider Africa, that's all. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Fred. And given Dalberg is an organization where over half of our people are based in Africa, I couldn't agree with you more. And I suspect that Gabrielle, from an emerging markets perspective, might have something to share. Africa, of course, is more of a frontier market, but nonetheless. Other questions? Uh, yes, the gentleman here. Hi there. Um, in today's seemingly small world where it feels like everyone is a LP or GP in someone else's fund, um, what's your perspective on funding competitors? Do you? Uh, within your own funds, do you avoid it altogether, or do you kind of take the soft bank approach of you know putting two competitors against each other and seeing which one emerges? That's great. And the patient gentleman down the front here. Uh, my name is Jeroen Tielman, Qstone Capital. Um, if you add sustainability as one of your investment criteria, what's your belief? Is it a drag on returns, or is it a p potential positive on returns? Thank you, sir. Over here. Yes, the lady in the back waving. Motion apparently helps me. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Jorien Wouter. I'm the Minister Plenipotentiary of St. Martin here in the Netherlands. Uh, thanking the, the audience, or the, the, the panelists, and the facilitator for the wonderful contributions. I was curious to understand whether um, venture capitalists or uh, investment funds have an interest in the cultural sector. Uh, and especially uh, NGOs that have an interest to, to further expand public-private partnerships? And if so, what type of conditions or frameworks to, to consider as relevant? Thank you, ma'am. All right, let's take that handful then. Question around funding competitors. What's your perspective? Ever do it? Uh, sustainability, do you integrate it? And if so, how do you see it as a drag or a boost? And last but not least, um, is there an engagement on the cultural side with NGOs? How do public-private par public partnerships uh, play or not play into the deals that you do? Over to Joshua. So on the question of uh, funding competitors, we typically will not do it <clears throat> on a fund level because you don't want uh, your resources split between two different companies. However, there are times where we'll make an early stage investment into a company, it will then grow and it'll grow you know, beyond our capabilities where it's to doing totally fine, millions of dollars, and then an upstart will come along that is slightly different, you know, competitive in nature, but a little different, and the possibility of funding them does exist, um, but it's a very delicate balance because it depends on if it's in the same fund versus in a different fund, but 
amongst the same portfolio? And is it attacking the same geography, the exact same market? If it's in a different geography, that can be a lot easier to fund. But it's a very delicate balance. And we would always clear that with the initial entrepreneur. We would, we would never be opaque with that. Because again, this is a relationship game, right? So it's critical. I'll speak uh, to the question that came from this side of the room. Uh, we do consider those types of, of, of partnerships. However, we're very, very selective. We've, we, we run an NGO. We're involved extensively in that world. The kind of NGO that we're looking for has a sustainability to it and a business model. Um, we want to, in, in those cases, um, not... not um, create systems of dependency. And, and so we look for those NGOs that have their own life or we can help them get there. And so that has actually been a lot my experience of how, how do I take an NGO and create a sustainability model there? And it, it may mean that we, 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 part of that strategy is to create partnerships that make sense. Uh, but uh, funding an NGO over many, many years is, is not something we we look to do. Uh, we take those NGOs that we see potential in uh, to build a business model, drive a, some sort of revenue, and and add value uh, wherever they are. So those those are interesting. We're highly selective about them, but we don't say no to them. In terms of the sustainability, is it a drag or a, a, a benefit? Um, we always have to see uh, the positive on it. We, we don't try to design our deals uh, to compensate for the downside, we I think there are many opportunities out there where sustainability is actually a plus. Yeah, same for me on the last on the sustainability question. It's case by case. You you cannot you have to evaluate it on, in each situation. Carrie Lee. Yeah, I was just going to say the other thing, particularly with family offices, is um, you need to understand that the, the the family itself would typically have a, a very strong value system. And many of them will either subscribe maybe to giving it all away um, to the pledge or will have philanthropy. And so there is often some some challenges, at least in, in our particular thing, where we are a large philanthropy um, player in our market. Um, we have very clear about what we do with that. Then we're also an active investor. So I think sometimes you can get kind of caught between different investment Things because you're you're you know because it's very clear to us what's philanthropy and what is impact investing and what is but it may not be clear as you're trying to come in so I think that's the challenge I get a lot of people pitching me um, stuff that I just it's not in my wheelhouse and I have to refer them to someone else and it, it's just not as clear cut as other people that just do it as a specific investment so. And for what it's worth, I'll say that we, at Dalberg, we do a lot of ESG sort of uh, portfolios, and you price it in. And it depends so much on whether, what the, the time horizon is of the investor, the nature of, of the, the, the aspect of sustainability. Um, but in general, if the time horizon is aligned, it does tend to be more of a driver, in my experience, of, of value creation, or at least at the minimum risk mitigation, than not. Let's do a final round of questions, and I'll ask my panelists for a parting word of wisdom. So final round, the gentlemen, these two gentlemen in the front. Um, so looking forward over the next five to 10 years, and keep, uh, apart from your current portfolios, um, what do you think will keep you up at night? Thank you. Yeah, I'm um, Sam LG, um, uh, VP of uh, WBG SIC, and I, we're a uh, uh, silicon carbide startup. And the question is uh, very similar to the gentleman from um, Africa. Um, how, how is it that, um, you, know, you know, the average age of uh, our team is probably in excess of 70, uh, but we're all healthy. Uh, I, have a, I have a father who's going to celebrate his 100th birthday, as an example. Uh, so all I'm saying is, uh, how is it possible? I mean, it seems like we're, we're being discriminated. I don't know what the term is. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've spent all my life um, in the Silicon Valley designing new chips uh, for over 40 years. I have, um, multi uh, in terms of experience, you know, we've worked with companies like Intel, 
uh, advanced micro devices, uh, uh, a, uh, analog devices, uh, uh, Texas instruments. And so, your question is, how is it possible that investment hasn't come your way to date? That's right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, who else we got out there? It's the last, the last chance, my friends. All right. Ladies, I cannot find a single lady hand. Okay, excellent, thank you. I need to crowdsource this. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mudoni. I'm, I'm a Kenyan living in South Africa. I attended a forum this morning about finding women and I got very worried by the statistics. Where we are told, for example, in the Netherlands, only 1% of funding goes to women-led companies. Just want to hear from panelists. What's your view and do you have, do you believe that funding has gender? <laughs> Thank you. And thank you. She act, asked it so nicely. But it is true. I believe it's something on the order of, I might get this wrong, but 2% of private equity goes to women-owned businesses. All right, one more last. Uh, yes. Deep back. Oh. Hi, I'm uh, Ramzi. I'm from Lebanon. I have a startup that started there, but our markets are Western markets. So my question is, how do you think that an international entrepreneur, especially from uh, developing countries, uh, can approach Western investors? And how can you develop that personal relationship when you're so far off geogra geographically? Thank you, Ramsey. That's great. So we have a, a few questions then around the five to 10 years. What's keeping you up at night? Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Um, women and gender, what, what, how do you integrate or how do you reflect that um, in your own investment decisions or do you? Um, and the question I think of, if you're in the global south, how does one develop these relationships with people in the global north? Who would like to kick off? Gabrielle? One more and and why, why does that gentleman have no investment? <laughs> it might be hard for them to guess, but... So I might just propose a strategy. I know that we're in the tail ending times. Maybe we each try to answer one of the questions. Sounds um, great. OK. OK. I'll answer um, the, the last, uh, second to last question. Um, we don't have any quota uh, or mandate on we invest in women co companies or women-led entities. What we do value is, is the authentic uh, leadership capacity that comes from women. And we value that. And uh, so I'm, I'm a woman. I'm, I, I am trying to find places uh, and, and people uh, to invest in. And I, we do place a high value on, on women in the workplace and, and women-led organizations. In developing markets, I'm often looking at underutilized resources. Uh, ones that exist that are not currently being maximized or optimized, and women are often those resources. And so they are some of my, my favorite partners and uh, favorite parts of my portfolio. So I'll answer the easiest question, which is what keeps me up at night over the five to 10 year uh, horizon, and that's technology, the pace of technology, technological disruption. So that is often often the hardest part to assess, evaluate when you make an investment. Um, I don't know if it's the easier one, but it was going to kind of tie into the the female thing well, which is I think that um, the, d there is a diversity um, element which we are starting to I think as investors you need to approach things slightly differently. You know, the whole adage is if you go after the same thing as everyone else is going after, you're going to get an average return. You need to go under into underserved markets or into, you know, which were, it's just an arbitrage opportunity until funding is equal, right? As soon as everybody gets the funding that they need and it's not based on who you know and how you know and everyone can get bus their businesses, then there's no more of an arbitrage. But at the moment, there is an opportunity. 
So I think if you approach it like a sales call, there's always going to be objections, right? You never get to a sales call and someone gives you an objection. So if you've got an objection about the age of your, you just have to learn how to deal with it better. Like, I mean, maybe it is the fact that your father's having his 100th birthday is how you deal with it. But I think that, you know, the point is, is it's just an objection that someone's giving you and you've got to turn it around and actually deal with it as um, you know, whether it's a sense of humor or you actually do a big data thing about, you know, the, the experience and why it is the unique thing that you have. That's your investable, you know, I think maybe your, there's always this thing about your, your thoughts drive your feelings and your emotions. Maybe you have a thought that you're too old, but I think if you turn it into an investable sales objection and actually just deal with it as an objection, um, then you should get through, I would think. Uh, so I'll take the last one in terms of building a relationship from afar. Uh, email is a very valuable tool. So as long as you communicate effectively with the investors you're trying to approach, you can build a very good relationship uh, over email. We had a company that we funded out of Vancouver. I was there for one time for a panel. I sat down with the entrepreneur over dinner, and over the course of a year, we built a relationship over email, emailing. He would email me every month with an update, milestones, what he was doing, and he would always ask for advice and counsel. And so he would take them to task. So he would really, uh, you know, take the counsel and do it. Uh, there was a point where he tried to go off the deep end with blockchain. I talked him out of it, thankfully. You know, but but things like that, where you are responsive, you're asking for advice, you are responding to that advice, uh, is very important. So for Lebanon, you know, you want to build in Western Europe first. So France and England are your your you know, target markets to start, and then you can build into the United States simply because there's more venture capital there, right? But you have to start small, you have to start slowly, and you have to be committed to a long-term time horizon. Uh, a lot of GPs that sit in my position, we all have kids. Time is very different when you are a parent, okay? It speeds up dramatically. So one year for an entrepreneur, which sounds hellish, is a moment for me because I'm dealing with so many different companies and so many different kinds of things. So don't be distraught where things are gonna take a lot of time, okay? Because it takes time to build something really valuable. Thank you so much. So the organizer said we had an, another minute or two, so we're gonna take this for the last lightning. Now think one phrase, one tip, one trick, one reflection, if there's any parting word. You've heard the questions in the room, you've been meeting entrepreneurs. Anything that you haven't said that you'd like to leave with? Um, hustle as a strategy. <laughs> Invest in the relationship and be patient. We are very busy people. We're looking at a lot of things. Um, but where things take our interest, we will come back to you. So the hustle is important, but also patience on the other hand. Uh, I agree. <laughs> Uh, and be vision-led, so be very clear about where you want to be in five years from now, and that probably dis drives your decision-making on who you want to partner with. Um, I, my own mic. Um, I, I think that you cannot underestimate how hard this is. I think that there is a perception in media and on television shows that everyone just goes out and raises money. And even in your little ecosystem, there's somebody who you know doesn't have as good a business as you, but they've raised money. There's just some people that are really good at raising money. They don't have a camera in a business to save their life, but they can raise money. So don't compare yourself. I, it, this is hard. Um, you know, I, I've been there. I've raised money and exited a business, and it was the hardest thing I ever did. So you know, don't look at what other people are doing and think you're doing something wrong. Um, this part of the journey. So just stick at it. Thank you so much. Well, I think I won the lottery with this group of panelists. I hope that you all found it very um, useful. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you.